Hey everyone, I, I think uh, we'll, we'll get started. Um, so this time last year, I spoke at NDC Oslo and I, I gave a talk on cognitive biases, which is an area of psychology. And during the talk, uh, I use an example of an air crash to highlight something called fixation bias, where you get so focused on something that you forget everything else. And I got some good feedback for the talk, which is great, but the most outspoken feedback was from people who wanted more plane crash stories. So here we are, literally a whole talk about plane crashes. But I wanna emphasize that my goal today isn't to scare the shit out of you about flying, it's to help you understand why commercial air travel is incredibly safe. And I think that there's a lot we could learn from their industry and how they do things. I used to travel a lot before COVID, and um, not just for conferences, but also for work. And um, most of my family lives in Ireland, but I live in Australia. So I literally circle the globe regularly. And learning about this stuff has actually made me more comfortable about flying. So in 2019, more than four and a half billion passengers were carried on 43 million commercial scheduled flights. But aviation safety was constantly in the news. The Boeing 737 MAX crisis probably being foremost in most people's minds, which we'll get to. But according to the Bureau of Aircraft Accidents, uh, 125 accidents occurred in 2019, claiming 578 lives. That's the sixth lowest number of accidents in modern history and the third lowest number of deaths after 2017 and 2013. This also represents a significant drop over 2018, which had over a thousand. And 2018 was still the 11th safest year on record. About half the deaths last year were in commercial airlines. The vast majority of crashes actually involve small private aircraft, military aircraft, or air taxis. Four major airline accidents occurred, which together killed 239 people. The only death in a commercial passenger flight in a Western country occurred when a Pen Air flight overran the runway in Alaska, in the US. That passenger was killed when a detached propeller blade sliced through the cabin. 2019 also marked the European Union's fourth consecutive year without any airline passenger fatalities, and the second year in a row where there was only one death in the United States. The former Soviet Union countries continued to struggle with accidents in Russia and Kazakhstan, and continuing the region's trend of one to three major crashes per year. And in fact, the former USSR and Africa together accounted for the vast majority of airline deaths last year. While Southeast Asia, um, the third kind of problem area for aviation safety, avoided any major accidents. So I want to start with the crash that I used as an example last year. And um, for those of you who haven't heard it, and for those of you that have, uh, I have a video this time. And um, so we'll jump in. United Airlines Flight 173, pictured here, um, was a cross country flight from New York to Portland with a stopover in Denver. On the 28th of December, 1978, the plane operating the flight was a 1960s era McDonnell Douglas DC-8, a four engine narrow body jet capable of carrying more than 250 passengers. For the evening leg, the Denver to Portland leg, 179 passengers and 10 crew boarded the plane. The pilot in command was Malvern McBroom, one of United's most experienced captains, along with a, a much less experienced first officer and a flight engineer, Forrest, Frosty, Mendenhall. The flight proceeded normally until a final approach into Portland, just after 5 p.m. local time. Coming in from the southeast, the crew ran through the approach checklist, which included lowering the landing gear. But there was a problem. The cylinder housing the actuator um, for the hydraulic piston that retracts the right gear assembly was actually severely corroded. When the crew lowered the gear, the corroded actuator broke away from the piston rod, allowing the gear to drop suddenly into place with a loud bang that shook the whole plane. In the cockpit, the light that should show that the, light, the right gear was down and locked failed to illuminate. This was because the force of the free-falling landing gear had actually cut the circuit to the indicator light, and the landing gear was in fact down and locked. But the crew had no way of knowing that. So the captain advised air traffic control that flight 173 had a problem with its landing gear and it needed to hold until it was resolved. The controller directed the DC-8 into a holding pattern, basically flying in a circle southeast of the city to let the pilots figure it out. To confirm if the gear was down, the flight engineer went back to the cabin with a flashlight to check for a small rod that would pop up on the top of the wing when the gear was down and locked. 
Looking out through what was probably a startled passenger's window, he thought he saw the rod, but wasn't totally sure. This only reinforced Captain McBroom's concern that the, the right landing gear wasn't locked and might collapse on land. They ran more checks, but they were inconclusive. About 30 minutes into the holding pattern, he called up the lead flight attendant to brief her on the situation. He told her that they would be making an emergency landing and that the passenger cabin needed to be prepared. At 5.47, the first officer asked flight engineer Mendel, how much fuel have we got left? Mendenhall reported 5,000 pounds, which was barely anything for an airplane. And that should have been a clear signal that they needed to stop holding and get the plane on the ground. Unfortunately, the captain didn't seem to take the hint. And he said, I figure another 15 minutes. Apparently, still trying to look at, for that one perfect test that would tell him with absolute certainty whether the gear would lock. The flight engineer was clearly not happy with this and said, it's not enough. It's 15 minutes is going to run us really low on fuel here. Basically doing his best to tell Mac Broom that they were running out of fuel without actually telling him that they were running out of fuel. At 5.54 p.m., nearly coming up to an hour um, since they started the loop, um, Captain McBroom sent Flight Engineer Mendenhall back to the cabin to check whether the passengers and crew were ready for the emergency landing. This was right about the time that they should have left the holding pattern and resumed their approach to the airport. But seemingly kind of oblivious to the fuel situation, Captain McBroom turned back to the southwest again and started another loop. This would have them still in the air well past McBroom's own estimate of a 6.05 arrival. At 6.06 p.m., with the plane still heading away from the airport, the lead flight attendant finished preparing the cabin and reported to the crew. Captain McBroom then finally acknowledged that they were ready to land. At that exact moment, the number four engine started to roll back as its fuel tank ran dry. The first officer said, we're going to lose an engine. Captain Mike Broom asked why, apparently caught by surprise. Fuel, said the first officer in what I imagine was quite a sarcastic tone. The pilots rushed to open the crossfeed valves, which would allow pumps to transfer fuel from tanks that still had some fuel into those that did not. But this would prove pretty useless as all of the fuel tanks were running dry. The number four engine flamed out, followed moments later by number three. Flight 173 turned onto the final stretch towards the runway. 19 kilometers short of the runway, engines number one and two also ran out of fuel and flamed out. The crew briefly thought about landing at a small municipal airport or even on a highway, but it was quickly clear that even those were too far away. But less than two minutes before the plane would hit the ground, the crew had to find some place to crash land in the middle of a heavily forested suburb. They thought they spotted a dark area up ahead that might be an open field and aimed towards it as best they could. Unfortunately, what they were looking at wasn't a field. It was actually a section of a neighborhood where several houses just happened to not have any lights on. The DC-8 just barely avoided a multi-story apartment tower before coming down in the forest. The plane plowed through the trees before the left wing struck a house, ripping the wing off and leveling the building. The rest of the plane slid across the street, bringing down power lines before striking another house and demolishing it. The cockpit and first class cabin disintegrated while the rest of the fuselage came to a halt across three back gardens. At the front of the plane, the lead flight attendant was dead, along with the flight engineer and eight passengers. But Captain McBroom and the first officer had miraculously survived. Along with the 171 passengers who were already now making their way out of the intact fuselage into the neighborhood. Incredibly, despite the fact that the plane had totally destroyed two homes, both were unoccupied and no one on the ground was hurt. By aiming for a dark space that he thought was a park, McBroom had actually steered the plane towards the one part of the neighborhood where no one was home to turn on the lights. Once the dust cleared on all this, though, the industry was faced with a very hard question. How had an experienced crew flying a perfectly ser serviceable airplane run out of fuel and crash, killing 10 people? The answer to this would change aviation forever.
The National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, who investigate crashes in the US, found that the crew, especially Captain McBroom, became so fixated on fixing, on fixing the landing gear that they totally lost the plot. They actually forgot to fly the plane. McBroom's tunnel vision caused him to lose his sense of the passage of time in relation to the fuel on board. And even hints from the co pilot that they were running low were automatically tuned out. The first officer and flight engineer failed to assert themselves and instead kept waiting for McBroom to, to look up and see the writing on the wall. This showed that the respect for McBroom's authority was getting in the way of safe flying, especially for Mendenhall, who was keenly aware of the situation but still did whatever McBroom told him to do, even when it didn't make sense. In its final report on the crash of 153, the NTSB forcefully recommended the introduction of what's now called Crew Resource Management, or CRM into every airline cockpit. CRM training would teach captains to delegate responsibilities effectively, ensuring that someone was always flying the plane. It would also help them ensure that people aren't overloaded with responsibilities and to communicate clearly and directly asking fellow crew members for info. It would also teach first and second officers to speak up when they were concerned, even introducing kind of formulaic openers that they could use to initiate a conversation with the captain about a problem. They would also be taught that sometimes the captain really doesn't know better and that when safety is on the line, they should take control of the plane. United was the first to adopt CRM training and all other major US airlines quickly followed. Today, CRM is used by every airline around the world and even in other high stakes professions such as emergency medical care and firefighting. Its impact in lives saved is incal incalculable. Um, in fact, it's widely regarded as the single most significant factor in the dramatic improvement of aviation safety in the last 40 years. Based on passenger deaths per kilometer traveled, flying in 2019 is more than 32 times safer than flying in 1970. Because pilot error is the single largest cause of accidents, much of that improvement can be credited to CRM. Now, we're not typically considered a high stakes profession, but there is a lot that we can learn from crew resource management. Understanding how you communicate as a team and with other teams is one of the most important factors in the success of most projects. And I think most of us would agree that the way in which a lot of companies organize and manage technical teams is disappointing. When I first started out a long time ago, I assumed that there would be structured processes and patterns like we'd learned about at university. And it was kind of shocking to realize that managers were basically just winging it and making it up as they went along. And I think that the, the kind of the lack of structured process is why we've seen things like people copying the Spotify model and why monstrosities like kind of safe, the scaled agile framework exists. We, we've kind of longed for the one true way of doing things kind of a best practice for teams. And what I think a lot of companies are starting to realize though is that you can't just copy and paste organization design and there's just too many variables involved. In it. But we can take inspiration from techniques which allow organizations to strategically design and train more effective teams. And I've been really excited with the momentum that's kind of growing in this space. And there's a few resources that, that can really help you to get started. Team topologies, blew my mind when I read it last year. It really brought together a lot of concepts that have been gaining traction and combined them with real practical advice. It proposes that we restrict team responsibilities to match the maximum team cognitive load, similar to CRM, so that we don't overburden them with, with more tasks than they can keep in their collective hands. It also details topologies to help you structure your teams within the situational context of your organization. Wardley Mapping has put evolution at the forefront of everything that we do, helping us to finally visualize where we're going. And dynamic reteaming helps us to build learning organizations by nurturing and developing our people and teams. And these new approaches uh, combine extremely well with, with somewhat older concepts like DDD, Domain Driven Design. And I hope it might bring some of the promise of DDD to the fore and maybe stop shitty microservices implementations from happening. I really do feel though that we're starting to develop the tools necessary to design modern teams more purposefully and effectively. And 
we're coming close to defining our own version of a kind of a crew resource management for IT. If you haven't read any of these books, I would highly recommend you do. Grab them this weekend, have a read. They are absolutely awesome. Going back to Captain McBroom though. So although his mistakes were kind of symptomatic of a deeper underlying problem in the aviation industry, he nonetheless took the fall for the crash and was forced to retire immediately afterwards. He lost his license and he never flew again. McBroom kind of appeared to, to waver between blaming himself and blaming the system, though he clearly knew both were at fault. Most people in the industry, though, felt only pity for him rather than anger. He'd fallen prey to something that really could happen to any of us. And the attitude towards apportioning blame has changed in the industry as it's matured since the 1970s, which we'll see in my next example here. On the 1st of June 2009, this aircraft, an Airbus A330 flying as Air France Flight 447, took off from Rio de Janeiro to Paris. It proceeded normally for around three and a half hours, by which point it had entered a radar dead zone in the middle of the Atlantic, where neither the Brazilian controllers nor the controllers in Senegal on the other side of the Atlantic could see the plane on their screens. At 1.55 AM UTC, Captain Marc Dubois traded places with the relief co-pilot David Robert. Robert flew alongside co-pilot Pierre Cedric Bonin for another 15 minutes before things began to go wrong. A large thunderstorm appeared in the plane's path, but the pilots decided to fly through it because they couldn't climb high enough to go over the top. Now, normally pilots would fly around thunderstorms, but 447 didn't for reasons that we still don't know. Although it was unlikely to put the flight in serious danger, the thunderstorm did cause a minor issue. Ice crystals collected on a part of the plane called pitot tubes. The pitot tubes are tiny tubes on the outside of the aircraft that measure airspeed as the air rushes into them. But because they were blocked, they began feeding incorrect information to the autopilot. This then switched the flight controls to a state that's called alternate law. In alternate law, any autopilot functions reliant on airspeed were turned off, including the plane's auto stall capability. Stalls are what happens when there's not enough airflow going over the wings and the plane can't produce enough lift. And it's typically caused by what's called a high angle of attack where the plane is pointing too high. The pilots had been briefed on what to do if the pitot tubes became blocked. They should simply keep the aircraft level until they unblock themselves. It usually takes less than a minute. But as the autopilot disconnect warning sounded, the pilots didn't take those steps. And what followed was a complete breakdown of every single principle of crew resource management. First Officer Bonin announced that he had control, but instead of holding the plane steady, he panicked and pulled the nose up, sending the plane into a climb of over 7,000 feet per minute. Now, a variety of factors might have contributed to, to this decision. The pilots were really startled by the sudden autopilot disconnect, and they dealt with it poorly. They had little to no training of flying the plane manually at high altitudes, and they'd lost trust in their airspeed readings even after they returned to normal. After climbing over 2,000 feet, the plane's airspeed dropped precipitously and the stall warning blared in the cockpit. First Officer Robert tried to tell Bonin that they needed to go down and Bonin agreed that they needed to descend, but nevertheless continued to pull back on the side stick, raising the nose now to 16 degrees. One minute after the control switched to alternate law, the aircraft stalled and began to fall from the sky. The plane fell almost straight down with a nose high attitude now of over 40 degrees and the engine at maximum thrust. The corrective action for, for them, this should have been obvious to the pilots. They should point the nose down and gain speed and recover from the stall. But still, neither first officer seemed to have any idea what was happening and they were overwhelmed by this emergency. Bonin in particular reverted to the most kind of primal instinct that if the plane is falling, you point the nose up to go up. Robert, meanwhile, didn't know what Bonham was doing, and Bonham never told him. To make matters worse, the, the pilots likely believed that they actually couldn't stall the plane. And had the controls been in normal law, that would have been right. But in alternate law, it couldn't prevent a stall. Captain Dubois returned to find the cockpit in chaos. He asked what was happening, and Robert responded, We're, we've totally lost control of the plane. Um, we don't understand at all. We've tried everything. 
plane was now falling at about 10,000 feet per minute from an altitude of 35,000 feet. The nose was pointed so high that the computer now considered airspeed measurements to be invalid and the stall warning stopped. This possibly kind of convinced Bonin that by pulling back in the control column, he was improving the situation. As the pilots discussed what to do about the situation, though, nobody mentioned the fact that they were stalling. Then finally, as the plane dropped through 10,000 feet, Robert said, climb, climb, climb. And Bonham responded by saying, but I've had the stick back the whole time. Finally, the crew understood why the plane was falling from the sky. First officer Robert immediately took over the controls without telling Bonham and pointed the nose down to try to gain speed. But they were rapidly running out of altitude. And within 30 seconds, Bonham had panicked again and retook control without informing Robert and pointed the nose up once more. With Bonin and Robert making opposite control inputs, the plane actually averaged the two and continued to fall in a roughly kind of horizontal position. As the plane hurled towards the ocean, the last words of the pilots were captured on a cockpit voice recorder. Um, Robert explained, damn it, we're going to crash. This can't be happening. Bonin asked, but what's happening? Du Bois answered, 10 degrees of pitch. A split second later, Flight 447 slammed tail first into the Atlantic Ocean, obliterating the aircraft and killing all 228 passengers and crew. Because the plane went down without any distress call in an area of ocean not covered by radar, it wasn't until almost two hours after the crash that anyone realized Flight 447 was missing. For over 24 hours, it seemed that the flight had vanished without a trace. That was until a Brazilian Air Force plane spotted an oil slick and light wreckage late the following day. Finally, on the third day of June, recovery ships reached the area and discovered floating bodies, personal effects, and the plane's vertical stabilizer seen here. But most of the wreckage actually lay far beneath the Atlantic Ocean at a depth of over 3,000 meters, and finding it would prove to be a monumental challenge. For two years, nobody really knew what had happened to Flight 447. After three long and fruitless searches the three, uh, in three different areas, the team finally located the wreckage in April 2011. The flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder were recovered from the wreckage in May. And 104 bodies were also brought to the surface, but 74 were never found. When investigators in France successfully downloaded and read the information in the recorders, what they found was almost inconceivable. That three experienced pilots flew a modern passenger plane in perfect condition, straight into the sea. And it would be easy to blame Bonin, and some do, but Flight 447 didn't crash simply because he pulled back in the control stick, but rather because of a convergence of small failures that had real deep psychological implications for the pilots. First, all three of the pilots may have been fatigued. Captain Du Bois could be heard on the cockpit voice recorder saying that he only got one hour of sleep. The pilots weren't sufficiently trained in hand flying the plane at cruise altitude. And most critically, the plane's automation, meant to help make flying easier, gave the pilots inconsistent and confusing information. The pilots didn't understand the autopilot's alternate law, and Bonin pulling back too far on the control stick actually caused the stall warning to stop due to what the computer perceived as inaccurate data. This reinforced that knee-jerk reaction he had to pull the nose up. Changes have been made to, to reduce the likelihood that such an accident will occur again. The pitted tubes on all Airbus A330s and A340s were replaced with a model that wouldn't report accurate speed, or, um, wouldn't report inaccurate speeds in icing conditions. This was before anyone even knew about the role that that, that malfunction had actually played in the crash of Flight 447. The final investigation report provided a long list of recommendations, ranging from clarification of the role of the relief first officer when sharing a cockpit with a new co-pilot to extending the battery life of flat, uh, flight recorder locator beacons to 90 days, which may have helped find the recorders earlier. Crews are now trained better to handle unreliable airspeed indicators and high altitude stalls. Pilots now, when faced with the same situation, will remember the mistakes of crew flight 447. So what I'd really like to highlight here that we can learn from is that the goal of the investigation wasn't to apportion blame. It was to discover what went wrong and how safety could be improved to ensure it didn't happen again. 
Well, Bonin was the, the prominent actor in the story. He was actually a relatively good pilot, but in a surprising situation that he hadn't had training for. First officer Bonin didn't go to work that morning, intending to crash a plane and kill himself and 226 other people. We're starting to see this kind of thinking in our industry too. Google's SRE team have a great write-up in their book on blameless postmortems and the inspiration that they took from the avi aviation industry. For them, a blamelessly written postmortem assumes that everyone involved in an incident had good intentions and did the right thing with the information they had. If a culture of finger pointing and shaming individuals or teams for doing the wrong thing prevails, people will not bring issues to light for fear of punishment. The recommendations made after the crash of Flight 447 highlight another area of interest. The automation was a contributing factor in the crash, and the changes made included more training for pilots to be able to handle situations where automation failed. Automation is a huge factor in the increase of airline safety, and it's the same for us. If you've read Accelerate or their State of DevOps report, you'll know the huge advantage automation is giving high performing teams. But it's important that People, uh, the people using your platforms understand the failure points of the automation and how to handle those situations. Team Topologies that I mentioned earlier also has some really good insights into how to structure platform teams uh, to support this when you're not a you know, Google or kind of Netflix size organization. One of the other things that I was super stoked to see in the most recent Accelerate DevOps report was the inclusion of psychological safety as a factor that affects high performing teams. In the airline industry, this is, uh, well, it kind of falls under what's known as human factors. Human factors is the application of scientific knowledge, mostly from areas kind of like uh, psychology, anthropology, physiology, and, and medicine. Um, to, to the design and operation of products and systems. The purpose of it is to, to attempt to, re to reduce the likelihood of negative outcomes by, by really understanding how people and groups of people function. This layperson's introduction to human factors training published by the Australian Transport Safety Bureau is a great short history of the field and includes great references to jump off uh, into details of the subject if you want to follow through. for time. Good. Okay. Um, so understanding how people think and react to things is obviously very, very useful. But to understand why people act the way they do, you need to understand the nature of the system that they operate in. You really need to understand the culture. On the morning of the 29th of October, <clears throat> 2018, Line Air Flight 610, operated by a Boeing 737 MAX 8, pictured here, um, pushed back from the gate at Sokarno Hatta International Airport in Jakarta. Captain Bahabe Suneja was in command of the aircraft, along with First Officer Harbina. Both pilots had more than 5,000 hours of flight experience on the Boeing 737 aircraft. At 6.20 a.m. local time, Flight 610 began its takeoff roll. Even before the plane had left the runway, they received the first signal that something was wrong. The control column started shaking loudly, warning that the plane was in danger of stalling and could crash. But the captain continued the takeoff procedure and started to climb. Two critical sensors registered different readings between the pilot and the first officer instruments, indicating two different values for the plane's airspeed and altitude, confusing both pilots. Two minutes into the flight, while still attempting to climb, the plane suddenly dropped over 700 feet, furthering the confusion inside the cockpit. The aircraft's automation had forced the plane's nose down. The pilots recovered from the drop, but noted to air traffic control that they were experiencing a flight control problem and considered requesting a return to the airport. As they continued their climb to a safer altitude over the next 10 minutes, this pattern repeated with planes automated automatic systems kind of um, pointing the nose down and Captain Tanasia correcting the input using the plane's electric trim buttons. In the space of one minute, the captain had to correct the altitude, the attitude of the plane more than five times. This created a kind of a tug of war between the plane and, and the pilots and it, it seesawed the aircraft more than two dozen times. Fighting against a system he didn't understand, Captain Sinejo repeatedly asked the first officer to checklist to handle unreliable airspeeds. 
As he continuously corrected the plane's attitude, Harbino looked through manuals and checklists, trying to find a solution to the problem, but to no avail. At 6.30 a.m., the captain handed control of flight 610 over to the first officer for reasons that are unclear. Instead of using the electric trim buttons to counteract the, um, to counteract the system, the first officer tried to fight manually, pulling back on the control column with everything that he had. 6.32, the first officer told Captain Tanaja twice that the plane was flying down. The captain responded to, its, to the second attempt that it was okay. The plane plunged 5,000 feet at nearly 700 kilometers per hour, straight into the Java Sea, killing all 189 people on board. It was just over 12 minutes from takeoff to the point of impact. Indonesia's National Search and Rescue Agency immediately launched an operation mobilizing thousands of people to recover the aircraft and the bodies of the passengers and crew. But even though the crash site was in a shallow part of the ocean, the violence of the impact made recovery difficult. The plane's flight data recorder was recovered on the 1st of November, but the cockpit voice recorder was not found until January the following year. It had been buried under eight meters of sand. On the 23rd of November, investigators concluded the victim identification process. Out of 189 people on board, 125 people were identified with 64 bodies still unaccounted for. When the MAX-8 revision of the enormously popular 737 series was imagined, Boeing was facing a competitive challenge from their only rival, Airbus. The new Airbus A320neo used new larger engines that reduced fuel consumption and promised significant savings in operating costs. Originally, it was thought it was thought impossible to put larger engines under the wings of the 737, which are actually lower than the wings of the A320. But faced with a competitor pulling away and the cost of designing a new airframe to compete being prohibitively expensive, Boeing found a way. By moving the engines forward and up, the new larger engines could be accommodated. The resulting plane was so nearly identical to existing 737s that the pilots on the current models could fly it without requiring expensive retraining, just like the A320neo. But by moving the engines up and forward on the wing, Boeing had changed the dynamics of flight, increasing the tendency for the plane to climb too steeply and induce a stall. Since the value proposition to airlines mandated that no new training, an automated solution was in order. Boeing quietly introduced the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS. In certain situations, MCAS would activate using stabilizer trim to correct the angle of attack. Unfortunately, where the sensor fails, the system would erroneously follow the same procedure, pushing the nose down to disastrous effect. On the 10th of March, 2009, five months after the crash of Lion Air, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302, another Boeing 737 MAX 8, crashed shortly after takeoff from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, killing all 157 people on board. The final report for the crash investigation of Ethiopian Airlines has not been released as yet, but from an interim report, the MCAS system was implicated as the cause of the crash. Shortly thereafter, the entire global fleet of 737 MAX aircraft was branded pending the investigation where they remain today. For Lion Air Flight 610, the final report was damning. First, it found the aircraft should have been grounded before departing on the fatal flight because of an earlier cockpit issue. One day before the crash, another flight crew on the very same aircraft experienced the same system malfun malfunction on a flight from Denpasar to Jakarta. Luckily, with the help of a third line air pilot who was coincidentally in the cockpit, the crew was able to deactivate the MCAS system and flew the plane manually to its destination. No entry was made in the maintenance log to warn later flights of the issue. So the pilots on board 610 died, not even knowing that there had been any problems in the previous flight. Further, the report found that the first officer who had performed poorly in training struggled to run through a list of procedures that he should have memorized. He was flying the plane just before it entered into the fatal dive, but the report said that the captain had not briefed him properly when he handed over the controls as they struggled to keep the plane in the air. So there's, there's lots of what ifs here. Um, if the crew of the previous day's flight had given a more detailed description of the problems, the aircraft might never have taken off. And if the captain who successfully kept the plane in the air hadn't, or hadn't handed over to his less capable first officer, disaster might have been avoided there too.
And it, it certainly raises questions about the safety culture in Ryanair. But in the report, most of the blame was centered on Boeing and the US Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. It pinpointed that the design and certification of the 737 MAX 8 as the primary root of the problems. Investigators listed the design of the MCAS system itself as a contributing factor because it relied on information from a single external sensor, and I quote, making it vulnerable to erroneous input from that sensor. They found that Boeing was able to design and test its own system without proper oversight or thorough safety assessment from the FAA. And Boeing engineers never expected the MCAS system to fail continuously and repeatedly and failed to even consider that as a possibility. In designing the system, Boeing concluded that a repeated failure of the MCAS was no more problematic than a one-time failure. Because they assumed that, that the pilots would simply apply the opposite trigger of to, to counteract the MCAS. They also assumed that pilots would immediately recognize the problem and override the system with manual flight controls. And they stated that doing so would not require exceptional pilot skills or strength. However, near the end of the, the line air flight, the first officer was pulling back on the control column with nearly 50 kilogram force, but he was unable to keep the plane from diving into the ground. Flight crews also lack key information about the MCAT system since none was included in the training or the, the aircraft flight line. When Boeing began marketing the 737 MAX 8, it was a brilliant success. They overtook Airbus in the segment, with the 737 MAX orders rising 300% in 2012, while A320 NEO's or, NEO orders dropped 50%. But internal communications handed over to congressional investigators in January 2020 this year exposed a bit of a collapse in the engineering culture and morale during the design of the 737 MAX 8. Employees who are developing the computer-based training for the 737 MAX suggested providing guidance in the pilot manual for how to handle certain emergencies. They also raised concern that the skills assumed were not very intuitive with younger pilots or those who may have become too reliant on automation. They were told that while that's probably true, through, this is the box we've been painted into and it's what we're being pressured to do. In short, Boeing's culture, driven by market forces and competition, had forgone safety. In the words of Stan Sorcher, a former Boeing engineer, priorities had shifted over the past two decades, with profits mattering more than quality. Now, culture um, is a bit of an overused and abused phrase in business. A lot of times when we hear organizations talking about their culture, they're, they're usually talking about things like how they have pizza and beers on a Friday, They've got an Xbox in the lunchroom. But that's, that's not really what culture is. Culture is the way that a company does things. And it's what's really, really important. For IT organizations, I like to use a model to describe their culture based around three factors, financial, operational, and quality. So like any good model, um, this is probably wrong, but it's useful. So let me explain the terms. Financial is the money side of the organization. If you're external facing, that's your sales team who are looking to keep competitive in the market, which is always aiming to drive down costs. If you're an internal facing team, it's your budget and the drive to cut costs or to kind of do more or less. Operational then is the delivery side or project management focus, where the drive is to keep the timelines and contractual obligations. The last side is what I call quality, and this is the drive for engineering excellence where as an organization, you want to build really high quality. Now, all of these drives exist within every IT org to, to varying degrees, but you can tell a lot by, by, um, by what the driving force is. One of the easiest ways to identify it is, is by looking at who the leaders of the organization are and what their background is. Organizations tend to promote from the area that's most important to them. So if the CEO came from sales, for example, then that's likely their main drive. The more that one drive takes over though, the more they push the others down to varying degrees. High sales focused organizations have a tendency to, to reduce the quality side, unless there's a significant reason to keep that investment for competitive purposes. The same can happen with operations, but those companies don't tend to last long because they tend not to really be able to get anything done and customers kind of flee from them. Steve Jobs gave an interview a long time ago 
where he died, obviously, um, that's available on YouTube. And it's about why Xerox failed. He explains this concept really well. And he talks about how the shift from product people being leaders in Xerox to salespeople being leaders um, brought about the end of what was then one of the most innovative companies in the early IT industry. It's well worth a watch, and I'll, I'll include a link in Slack after this. The trick to making this work that I've found is, is ensuring that your leadership has representation from all three sides and that they have equal power to affect change. And with all of this, it's a constant battle. Culture is one of those things that's hard to construct, but very, very easy to destroy. For Boeing, their change in, cult uh, change in culture had disastrous results, and it remains to be seen how they'll come out of it after this crisis, especially with COVID-19 and so on. But they're taking steps. Um, Boeing CEO Dennis Moylenberg was fired in December 2019 as Boeing's board lost confidence in his ability to handle the crisis. His replacement, David Calhoun, ran GE's aircraft engine division from 2000 to 2004. But he has a, a tough task ahead of himself. The airline industry itself is built on a culture of safety. There's no way that they could do what they do at the scale that they do it without it. And this is well illustrated by what's happened to Boeing. One of the key mechanisms that they use to achieve this is understanding risk. Every component that's used on an aircraft has well understood failure rates and appropriate maintenance or replacement rates to ensure that they don't get to that point. For this last example, I want to talk about something that's hopefully a little bit closer to home for you to highlight why understanding risk is important. Atlantic Airways um, was and still is, to, to a point, a state-owned airline belonging to the government of the Faroe Islands. The airline has at uh, various times provided services between Faroe Islands in the UK, Norway, and Denmark. In the early 2000s, a Norwegian engineering company, whose name I can't pronounce, regularly hired Atlantic Airways to, to fly its employees from its base in Stavanger to the town of Molde, um, with an intermediate stop at Stord Airport. This was in order to pick up um, additional passengers. Operating this charter flight, charter flight on the 10th of October 2006 was a British Aerospace, a BAE 146, a four engine short range jet designed for short takeoffs and landings, pictured here. The BAE 146 had a good safety record and several hundred were in service around the world. In command of the flight that day were two well regarded Faroese pilots. Captain Nicholas Durhus and First Officer Jakob Ebal, both of whom had perfect records and plenty of experience flying to small island airports. They were joined on the first leg by two flight attendants and 12 passengers who spread themselves out through the cabin, leaving most of the seats empty. After taking on fuel and passengers, Flight 670 departed Stavanger Airport at 7.15 a.m. Eight minutes later, First Officer Ewald opened radio communications with the approach controller based in a facility in Bergen and arranged to the land at Stord. It had been raining earlier that morning, but now the weather was clear. And although some water remained on the runway, it was, uh, wasn't enough to like, really call it wet. I expected the braking action uh, to be good. Stord Airport is a small airfield in southern Norway between the cities of, of Bergen and Stavanger. It hosts only a limited scheduled service using relatively small aircraft. And at the time, the BAE 146 uh, was the largest airplane that normally landed there. The airport is perched on a hilltop above a narrow channel between two islands and is surrounded by steep rocky slopes that descend straight into the sea. Both ends of the runway feature significant drop-offs with no room for air. But Atlantic Airways flew to many such airports and the pilots were well aware of the risks. The final approach proceeded smoothly as the pilots uh, carefully ensured that they flew at the correct speed and angle. All checklists were completed on time and the plane was properly aligned with the runway. 732 flight 60, the 670, excuse me, touched down and just a few meters from the ideal touchdown spot. The pilots began the series of steps needed to bring the plane to a stop. The very first step after touchdown is to deploy what are called lift spoilers. Lift spoilers are the set of flaps in the wings that literally spoil their ability to produce lift, allowing the weight of the aircraft to shift onto the wheels, which then makes the brakes more effective. As soon as the wheels touch down, the captain attempted to deploy the spoilers, but they failed. On the BAE 146, the spoilers are critical to bring the plane to a stop safely. 
it doesn't have the capability to generate reverse thrust, which means that it relies more heavily on the wheel brakes in order to slow down. The brakes, in turn, rely on the correct operation of the spoiler. If the spoilers don't deploy, the weight of the plane won't shift onto the wheels as quickly, and this can reduce brake effectiveness by up to 60%. So when Captain Dura has stomped on the brakes to, to try to slow down, he didn't receive the feedback he expected. Only a second or two had passed, and he hadn't really had time to make the connection between the lack of spoilers and the inability of the brakes to slow the plane. So he was really alarmed at the plane's excessive speed and tried to think of the, the last um, tried, sorry, the, the, the last solution that he could think of. He activated the, the plane's emergency brake. Unfortunately, this inadvertently turned off the plane's anti-skid system. Without the anti-skid system regulating brake pressure, the wheels locked and the plane started to skid. When the wheels locked, um, they experienced a rare phenomenon called reverted rubber hydroplaning. So in normal hydroplaning, a large quantity of standing water lifts the plane's wheels off the runway and prevents the brakes from slowing the plane. In contrast, uh, reverted rubber hydroplaning can occur when um, the runway is just damp as it was this day. As the tire slides across the runway surface, friction generates heat, which then causes the tire to revert to its original fluid-like uncured state. Friction also heats up the water on the runway until it turns to steam. The reverted rubber then forms a seal that stops, um, traps the steam, causing it to lift the tire partially off the surface. This causes the, the, the plane to slide along in a cushion of steam, basically, rendering the brakes almost entirely useless. In fact, as, as soon as Flight 670 began to experience reverted rubber hydroplaning, there was nothing the pilots could do to stop the plane in time. They were heading off the end of the runway no matter what. With the end of the runway rapidly approaching, the captain swerved the plane multiple times to try to bleed off speed, but it wasn't enough. Still traveling at 35 kilometers an hour, flight 670 skidded off the end of the runway, plunging down the steep forested slope. Rocks battered the fuselage and the number four engine was ripped off the wing. Finally, the plane slammed into a rock outcropping and ground to a halt. The right wing tore out of the fuselage on impact, leaving a hole in the roof through which the passengers were showered with jet fuel. A raging fire immediately erupted by the severed wing, growing to a considerable size within seconds of the crash. Inside of the plane, all 16 passengers and crew had survived, but their ordeal was really only just beginning. Back in the cabin, passengers rushed to try and find a usable exit as the flames consumed the right hand side of the plane. Both exits on the right side were blocked by fire and the front left exit wouldn't open, leaving only the rear left exit available. The rear flight attendant hurried to get this door open, but found it extremely difficult to keep it that way as it opened uphill and kept trying to swing close. Because the plane was sitting on a 30 degrees, uh, 30 degrees slope, passengers at the front of the plane had to climb up the aisle using the seats like a staircase to reach the tower. When they got there, they found themselves caught in a queue of people trying to get through the exit that refused to stay open. One passenger did try to open the right rear door, but the flames were, were too hot and they immediately closed the air. As the passengers began to jump the three to four meters down from the exit door, flames and smoke surged into the cabin. People then started to pour through the door, landing on top of each other as they hit the uneven ground below. As the last few passengers that escaped made it through the rear exit, the fire spread under the plane and erupted out of the left-hand side as well. Unfortunately, not everyone had escaped, but the plane was completely consumed in flames and there was nothing anyone could do to help them. In all, three passengers and the forward flight attendant perished in the flames. When the rescue concluded and the fire had been extinguished, investigators from the Accident Investigation Board of Norway, the AIBN, began to arrive at the scene. They soon discovered that finding the cause of the crash might be impossible. Both black boxes had suffered from prolonged exposure to fire and their protective casings had been compromised. The flight data recorder was almost a total loss with only small sections of the tape yielding any readable information. While some of the investigators looked into the operational aspects, others focused on trying to find out why the spoilers didn't deploy, but they struggled to find a conclusive answer. The final report, which was published nearly six years after the crash, stated that the investigators couldn't determine why the spoilers had failed to report. 
However, the AIBN did have a lot to say about the concept of latent risk. In analyzing the crash of Flight 670, it became apparent that landing a BAE 146 at stored was relatively risky and that this was actually known to local authorities. Earlier in 2006, Stored Airport conducted a study which found that the risk of an accident for a BAE 146 landing at Stored was approximately 2.24 by 10 to minus 7, or about 1 in 4.5 million. It sounds like a lot, but it's more than twice the International Civil Aviation Organization suggested maximum of 1 in 10 million. This was in part due to the fact that the BAE 146 was relying on the functional spoilers and that if they did not deploy due to either a mechanical failure or human error, the plane could run off the end of the runway and, and uh, fall down the slope. The study identified basically the exact scenario that led to the crash of Flight 670. But the airport only um, provided landing areas with a figure of 2.24 without including a breakdown of how that number was derived. This kind of abstract number is difficult to conceptualize on its own, and the airline apparently didn't. The investigators wrote that there are a few companies that have the knowledge or capacity to relate risk figures of this type and what they mean in practice. Had Atlantic Airways instead been provided with the specific risk factors that made that number so high? such as the, the vulnerability of the plane to its spoiler failures, then they might have been able to take action and mitigate the risk from it. The accident itself, though, should serve as a lesson about the nature of risk. It's a, the, the list of risk factors on that day was, was rather long. The BAE, BAE 146 didn't have reverse thrust. The, the runway was short. The airport had poor safety margins. The, the, the flight was landing with the tailwind, and the runway surface was down. In hindsight, we can look back and understand why a crash happened that day, but when events play out in real time, the, the big picture becomes much, much harder to see. And just to note here, before I finish up, if any of, if any of you have ever flown with Atlantic Airways or plan to in the future, you should know that the airline has always had a very high safety standards level, and because of this crash, they're now even higher. So, Risk and the understanding of risks is a fundamental part of what allows commercial airlines to operate at the safety standards they do. And it's something that we're definitely getting better at as an industry, particularly in the kind of large internet scale companies and cloud providers. But it's something that I rarely see discussed in most enterprise IT projects. And there's actually quite a lot of data and analysis around this that can help us. In general, project performance has actually been rising globally. In 2018, nearly 70% of projects met their original goals or business intent, while nearly 60% were completed within the original budget. But as we all know for sure, IT projects are notoriously difficult to manage. A survey published in the Harvard Business Review found that the average IT project overran its budget by 27%. Moreover, at least one in six IT projects turns into what's called a black swan, with a cost overrun of at least 200% and a schedule overrun of at least 70%. Among IT projects, failure rates correspond heavily to project size. A project with a budget of more, uh, over $1 million is 50% more likely to fail than one with a budget below $350,000. A PwC study of over 10,000 projects found that only 2.5 companies complete their projects 100% successfully. And these failures cost around 50 to 150 billion of lost revenue and productivity every year. 17% of IT projects can go so badly wrong that they can threaten the very existence of the company. But for most projects, they never even consider that as part of the possibility when they're, when they're doing their planning. So one thing I hear most from people when I bring this up is that it, it's harder and possible to quantify risk. And that's just plainly not true. If you can understand it, you can model it. Even if that just means that you put a realistic range on it, that's a much better answer than I don't know. And there's a whole bunch of tools out there that can help you. If you want to measure anything, there's a very useful book called How to Measure Anything that will help you to measure intangible things like the cost of security breaches or the cost of brand damage when you have a security breach. A mistake I see a lot of people making when they do start to look at risk is using averages. Averages are, are not great for understanding risk at the individual level. and You should really be using things like sampling ranges and models to assess these things. The flaw of averages explains this quite complex area very well and provides tools to help you get started with.
And finally, the work of Troy McGinnis from Focused Objective in Seattle provides free to use open source spreadsheets to help you get started with this for your software development project. I'll provide links to, to all of these in the Slack channel after, after the talk as well. For all of us personally, though, you know, whether you are buying a plane, driving a car, or I know you're like writing rock star code, it never hurts to, to think about what factors might be having roots. And if we can mitigate known risks, then we might avoid the unknown risks that silently accompany us on every, every journey. Time. Time. Cool. Um, good. So that's, that's uh, all I've got for you today. I, I hope you've learned something uh, about resource management, human factors, culture and risk. Um, and hopefully you feel a little bit safer about flying. Maybe, maybe not. Um, if you're keen to read more about air crashes, I'll provide a link in Slack to the work of uh, a Reddit user called Almer Cloudberg, who does amazing write-ups of accidents uh, and was the source of some of these stories that, that, I've, that I've shared with you today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can hit me up in the Slack room channel or chat, and my contact details are on the slide here in the bottom if you, if you want to add me. So with that, I'll say thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the day at the conference and uh, safe travels.